Acts chapter number 10. This last week we had our vacation Bible school and as part of our VBS I gave a lesson out of Acts chapter number 10 for the children who were at vacation Bible school um, and uh, as I was studying and preparing for that a thought came across um, out of this passage of scripture um, that I felt I would share with you guys tonight and so we're going to be looking at the story of Cornelius and Peter and Peter coming to him and, and give, sharing with him the Lord Jesus Christ. And, but for now, I want to read just one verse together, and then we're going to look at this one phrase in this verse, which will be the title of my message, and then we're going to sort of build a message around this thought or idea we see here in verse number six. Let's all stand together. Out of, uh, we're going to read together out of Acts chapter number 10. Just the one verse, and then we're really going to be looking at the whole chapter to, to, to get the whole picture of what is happening. But Acts chapter number 10, notice if you would, verse number 6, we'll read the verse and then we'll explain what leads up to this and what is happening in a moment. But Acts chapter number 10, verse number 6 says, He lodged with one Simon a tanner. He lodgeth, I'm sorry, he lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And I want you to notice that phrase, he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get into our message uh, this evening. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for <clears throat> all that you have blessed us with and all that you've given to us. Thank you for your word, Lord. I pray that you would be with this message. Lord, may it speak to our hearts tonight as we consider what you would have for every one of us. And Lord, you know, should this be the last service that we sit in? Should this be the last message that I preach? Um, Lord, may we allow it to affect us and to change us, and, and may there be an urgency about us, Lord, knowing that you may be choosing one of us or asking one of us to be a witness to someone else. We may be the person, Lord, that it being brought into someone else's path that needs to hear about you. It may be, Lord, that there is somebody else seeking you out, and Lord, may we be in the position of being able to tell them about you and to be a witness for you. Lord, be with this message, be with this time. Holy Spirit, work in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. We see in the book of Acts a lot of examples of where God's um, uh, you know, word is being preached and people are telling people, um, believers, disciples, are telling everyone they come in contact with about the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw a great commission that the Lord gave to his disciples in Matthew chapter number 28, a very common verse, very familiar verse with many of us. But um, the Lord told his disciples in verse number 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So here he's, he's telling them to go and to teach all nations, to go and reach out unto all nations with the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells those same disciples as he ascends up into heaven. In Acts chapter number 1, he gives them similar instruction as he has now died. Okay, went to, the, went to the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross and then died on the cross and then was buried. And again, three days later, he rose from the grave and conquered death and praise the Lord that he did. God's perfect plan of salvation. And so he, he conquered death, rose from the grave. Before he ascended up into heaven, he gave some final instructions to these uh, apostles in the book of Acts, right? Verse number eight of chapter number one. But ye shall receive... Power. So he tells them, you're going to receive power. What is this power for? What is this power to do? What, why are they receiving power? You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. The Lord said, I'm going to give you power and that power is to be a witness for me and that's exactly what has happened 
It's not a power to be able to speak in tongues in some sort of a secluded meeting somewhere at a church. It's not a power to um, edify yourself in a prayer closet somewhere in some kind of a foreign language or some kind of a gibberish language. Um, it's not a power to somehow bring fame or glory to yourself by having some kind of a, a ability that other people don't have and you can heal people, that kind of thing. The power is what? To be a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ to this lost world. And then you begin to see that play out in the book of Acts. Uh, and this is happening here in chapter number 10. Now we have these believers. They know who Jesus Christ is. You have Paul, a major character in the book of Acts, and he tells everybody he knows and goes to the synagogue and tells the Jewish people about the Lord Jesus Christ and how he you know, died and, and, and how he rose again from the grave and how you have crucified him. And then after uh, he tells them, he goes to the Gentile as well and tells them about the Lord Jesus Christ and that Jesus the Messiah has come and that he did live on this earth and that he did live a perfect life and that he died on the cross but he died for the sins of the whole world. And they're telling everybody they can come in contact with about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they receive power, to be a witness uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter number 10, we see an interesting story of a man who sought out God. Notice, if you would, Acts chapter number 10, verse number 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. And the Bible says, here is a man, he is a Gentile, right? He's not a Jewish man. He is not somebody who uh, would necessarily be um, skilled in the law of Moses, someone who does not have a heritage or, of being part of the chosen people that would hold the oracles of God. Here's a Gentile who simply recognized the God, Jehovah God of the Bible, of, of, of the law, and, and he recognized him and he worshipped him. And so this man Cornelius, the Bible says several things about him. It says he was a devout man in verse number two. He was dedicated Okay? He was dedicated, no doubt, to his family. No doubt he was an honest man, a hard-working man, dedicated to that which he knew he was supposed to do and to doing right. A devout man, the Bible calls him. Um, and one that feared God with all his house. Whatever knowledge he had of God, which was limited, by the way. Because we're going to see in a moment, he didn't know who Jesus Christ was. But the knowledge that he had of God... There was a great fear of God there. He had heard of the law of Moses. He had heard of God coming down and, and, uh, and, and, and letting himself be known to the Jewish people. And as a Gentile, he said, you know what? There's Jehovah God and I fear him. And, and I understand uh, there's a God out there and I understand who he is from the, uh, from, uh, from the word and I, and I, I fear God, okay? Um, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people. So he was a giving man, okay? He was a what man who was a devout man and a man that feared God and he was a giving man, somebody who put others first and there was a need that somebody had, he would be there for that, uh, for that individual, uh, no doubt in his town, wherever he lived there. Um, if there was somebody in town who had a need and, and he had a means to help them out with that, he would step in and help them out. A giving man, the Bible says, one who gave alms. Okay, alms would be giving to others and that ability we have to give to others. And so here was a man who was a giving man, helping others. He was a man of prayer, the Bible says in verse number two, and prayed to God always. He, he spent his days talking to God and praying to God. So here he's a devout man, the one that feared God, uh, gave much alms to people, was a giving man. He's one that prayed to God, spent time talking to God. Okay, here's a man, Cornelius was a man that had God's attention. Notice if you would, verse number four. Well, verse number, uh, okay, here's a man who, 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 verse number two talks about how he's a devout man, feared God, gave alms to people, prayed to God always. Verse number three, he saw a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel coming unto him and saying unto him, Cornelius. Verse number four, <clears throat> and when he looked on him, he saw, uh, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, listen to this now, thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. God noticed what Cornelius was doing. He got God's attention. It was a memorial before God. He realized, here's a man who is, let's get this now, here's a man who is seeking me out. He wants to know me. He is praying. Um, he's seeking me out. Here's a man who needs to know more about me. 
Here's the man seeking me out, and your prayers and your alms and all that you are doing to serve me is being noticed, okay, by God. What does he tell him to do? Verse number five. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He said, all right, you are praying, you are giving, you're devout, you're dedicated to what you do, um, you fear me, you know I'm real, you fear me. But there's more you need to know about me. You're seeking me out. But there's more you need to know about me, so I'm going to give you some instructions. Send men to Joppa, all right? And call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. It is interesting to me that Cornelius was seeking God out, feared God, did right before God, and God realized that Cornelius needed to know more about him and needed to know further truth. So what did he do? He sent him to Peter. He sent somebody into his life to be able to teach him more. Now there's many ways that God could have told him. God could have spoken to him directly. He spoke to Saul directly in, in chapter number 9 caught him on the road to Damascus and told him exactly what he needed to know. Um, uh, but for the most part, in the word of God and overall, God will use other individuals to come into your life if you were seeking him out to give instruction. We see that example for us in the Bible. There are many things that God could have done. God could have given that angel specific instructions to tell Cornelius about the Lord Jesus Christ or God could have spoken to him directly himself. But rather than do that, God said to Cornelius, I'm going to send somebody. Somebody's going to tell you about uh, what you need to know He's going to tell you the things you need to know, and, and, and he will be the one, okay? <clears throat> he shall tell you what the ought is to do and what you should do from here to this point out. And so Cornelius is excited about this. Okay, God's now speaking to him and directing him and giving him instruction on what to do. And we see this really um, as a pattern in Scripture. When we seek out God, he will answer. Acts chapter number 8, verse number 31. You remember when, um, uh, uh, well, let's turn back there just a couple of pages. Acts chapter number 8. You remember when Philip uh, was sent um, by God to go south and, and he arose and went, verse number 27, and behold, a man of Ethiopian and eunuch of great um, authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and came to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read and read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself unto his chariot. So God sent Philip to this man who was reading the Bible, the Ethiopian eunuch to him, as he was reading the book of Isaiah. God uh, uh, sent Philip to him, the Bible says in verse 30, and Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, get this, How can I, except some man should guide me? So here we see in Acts 8.31, and he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him, and God sent this Ethiopian eunuch, a man, to explain the scriptures to him. John chapter number 5 and verse number 7, it was the impotent man by the, by the pool, impotent man by the pool of Bethesda, and when the Lord came by him, and the Lord said unto him, Are you going to be healed today? His response was, the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. There's nobody here who's going to help me get into this pool to be healed. Mark chapter number 2, verse number uh, 3, talks about those four men that brought the, uh, the, the man who was palsy down to the Lord, but they had to bring him through the roof. The Bible specifically says, And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Four men that had to help this man with the palsy to get down to the Lord Jesus Christ so he could, she, she, he could be healed. Romans chapter number 10, verse number 14, How then? Shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? It is God's pattern that he will use man and use believers to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ, about himself. And so here in chapter number 10, we have Cornelius who's seeking God out. And he wants to know the truth about God. And so, uh, more about God and the, the whole picture of the truth about God. And he feared God. And he's a devout man. Uh, and God gives him instructions. And what does he tell him to do? Send men to Joppa and call for one Sim, Sim, uh, Simon. Acts chapter number 10. Let's see what happened. Verse number 7. And when the angels which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called to his household servants and a devout soldier of them which... 
uh, that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. So here they are now on their way to Joppa. Meanwhile, we have Peter. Now Peter is the one they're being sent to, right? So, so Cornelius is sending his men to go get Peter. Now, while Cornelius is seeking out God, and while God is giving instruction to Cornelius to send men to Joppa to find Peter, what is God doing? God is working on the heart of Peter. God is preparing Peter for what he needs him to do. Peter at this point has no idea what's going to happen. And it's a very interesting story, actually. So here we have in verse number 9, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up into the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he began and became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. So here's Peter up on his housetop, which wasn't that uncommon at that time to have an area to be on top of your housetop. And he began to get hungry that time of day. And and, uh, and the Bible says he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and uh, let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. Then there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. So here Peter is in this trance and this great sheet comes and you're familiar with the story. The great sheet comes down and all these different kind of animals are in the sheet and, and, the, and the voice from heaven says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Uh, verse number 14, but Peter said, uh, Not so, Lord. For I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Now it's interesting. He addresses him as Lord. He knows who he is. And he's arguing with God. He says, not so, Lord. This, this speaks of the extreme prejudice Peter had. Um, he has been so ingrained in what he knew that even God himself telling him directly to eat this stuff wasn't enough to really move Peter. He didn't understand how he could do this. He said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him in the second time, God hath, uh, what God hath cleansed, call not thou unclean. This was done thrice or three times when the vessel was received up into heaven. So here we have uh, Peter's heart being prepared over here with this unusual vision that he had, this weird dream that he had. What is this all about? He wakes up from this thing, scratching his head. He says, what was that all about? As he wakes up from his trance, he says, what in the world? That was an odd thing. You ever had a dream where you woke up and you said, that was just weird? <laughs> That's Peter, right? That was really weird. What was that all about? Verse 17, now why Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry of Peter's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, so meanwhile Peter's up there thinking on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. So here is Peter up on the rooftop, and he's already woken up from this trance, and now the Spirit is beginning to speak to him, and, uh, uh, and, and said unto him, Three men seek thee. Arise therefore, and go thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So he gives them warning. He said, All right, um, there's three men that are seeking you out. Um, uh, when, you, when they come, you just go with them. Don't doubt anything. Just go with these men. And sure enough, right after he did this, there's a knock on the door. All right, so he says, uh, there's someone at the door, they want Peter, okay, and the, and the Lord had told them, uh, uh, arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Verse 21, then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto the, um, from Cornelius and said, behold, I am him, him who ye seek, what is his cause whereof ye have come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the uh, nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send forth to thee, to his house, to hear the words of thee. And no doubt these guys thought to themselves, this is a pretty crazy story. I'm not sure if anybody's really going to believe this, but this is what happened. This is what our master told us, and we're just following instruction. Okay, he's, he's, a, he's a good man. He's even got a good report amongst the Jews. He's a Gentile, but he's got a good report amongst the Jews. And he has sent us because an angel talked him. Could you imagine someone coming to your door and saying, you need to come with me. God told me for you to come with me. You'd say, get off my property. You're crazy. <laughs> and who knows what kind of reservations they had about doing this, but yet this is what they were supposed to do. And so Peter follows <clears throat> because Peter had been warned. Then called he them in, verse 23, and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So he said, all right, no problem. I'm with you. They're probably a little surprised. Really? <laughs> Yeah, I'm with you. You know what? God told me I need to go with you. And so sure enough, he goes with them. Now, what's interesting is, he goes with them, and verse number 25, and Peter was coming in, 
Okay, verse number 24. And on the morrow they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. So here, Cornelius was busy uh, serving God, feared God, sought out God. Meanwhile, um, God talked to him and said, send some servants over to Peter. God's working on Peter's heart. All right, over here in this trance, God's working on his heart. And now Peter is prepared for whatever it is God would have him to do. God is now putting together two people, one seeking the Lord out and one prepared to do what God would have him to do and, and, and looking for those who were seeking the Lord out. Uh, and God brings them together. And Cornelius is so excited about hearing more about God, he gathers his whole family together and gets everyone in the household together, all the, the servants and his children and his wife, and everybody gets together. Uh, uh, and they all get together waiting for them and, and called together his kinsmen and his near friends. Verse number 25, and as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Uh, but Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I uh, myself also am a man. And, and he talked with him and went in and found many that were coming together. All these people were there waiting to hear what was going to be said by Peter as they were seeking out the Lord, and God was bringing someone to them. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into one of, uh, house, um, into one of another's nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Peter says, you know what? I get it. I know why I was in that trance. I know I, why I saw what I saw. Because the Lord Jesus Christ came for the sins of everyone, not just the Jewish people. Verse 29, therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, or as soon as I went, uh, as soon as I went for, sent, was sent for, I asked thereof of what intent ye have sent for me. So why, why did you send me? And Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in the uh, bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thy alms are uh, had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call uh, hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. Uh, he is lodged in the house of one Simon Tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Now, now stick with me here, verse 33. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, we are all here, present before God. We're all here. My whole family is gathered together. We're all wanting to hear what you have to say. We're all here, present before God, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Now, what does Peter do when he realizes why he's there? He had already prepared his heart. The message that he has is not just for the Jewish people, for the Gentiles also. And so what does Peter do when he finally has an opportunity to talk to Cornelius and his household? He preaches to them the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells them about Jesus. Notice if you would, verse number 34. Then Peter opened his mouth. And said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation. He that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted in him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. And he began to preach to him, as you look at his message over and over again, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as they hear about the Lord Jesus Christ, they too are filled with the Holy Spirit. And God used Peter to bring a message to a man who was seeking out God. God used Philip to preach the message of Jesus to a eunuch who didn't understand what he was reading. There was a man by the pool of Bethesda who said, how can I get to the pool? There's no one here to help me. There were four men who brought the man of palsy down to the Jesus so he could, they could, he could be healed. And over and over again, we're seeing in Scripture, God is preparing the hearts of individuals to point others towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's my question for you tonight. Is God preparing your heart that you can be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me give you several things, four quick things really we see in Peter. We ask ourselves, how can we be ready when God wants to send us? There are people out there seeking out the truth, and I've said that often, but it's true. There are people out there seeking out the truth. Now, if you go soul warning door to door, you'll get a lot of people who don't want to hear it, a lot of people who just think you're another fanatic, a lot of people will shut the door on you and say, we're not interested. A lot of people that will be, and here's what you get a lot of, right? A lot of people that are polite, but they're really not interested. Um, uh, because you're, we're Midwesterners, and that's the way we are. We're, we're polite and nice, but we, at the end of the day, we really don't want what you have to sell or give us. And we're going to kindly just say, oh, no, thank you, and shut the door. But amongst all that, there are people who are seeking out the truth of the word of God. And there are people who need a believer to say, Lord, prepare me 
get my heart ready, get my life ready so that those who are seeking come to my path, I can tell them about you. And that's exactly where Peter needed to be. Peter needed to be prepared and ready to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ when that time came. Several things we see about Peter, four quick things we see about Peter and, and that we could see in our own lives, okay? How can we be ready when God wants to send us? Number one, what do we see Peter do? Number one, Peter prayed. Notice if you would, verse number nine. On the morrow, as they went on their journey, so here's the men coming from Cornelius, heading out on their journey, and drew nigh into the city. Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Peter was having a relationship with God. Peter was praying to God, spending time with him, and as he did so, God then had an opportunity to speak to Peter and show Peter what he needed to know in order to be a witness for him. And we have to have a prayer life if we're going to be able to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hearts are going to be prepared to look for lost sinners that need to hear about the Lord and to be ready to tell people about him as you and I are spending time in prayer. See, when's the last time we prayed for lost souls? When's the last time we prayed for someone to get saved? When's the last time, it would not be out of the question in a church like ours where we promote, you know, a gospel witness. Not be out of the question for someone to come on a Sunday morning and say, hey, I want to get saved. What a blessing that would be. Have you been praying along that line? Have you been praying that God would do that? Have you been praying that, were you praying last week that God would bring some young people to our vacation Bible school that, that want to get saved and want to know the truth? I couldn't even believe, you know, I, I mentioned before vacation Bible school, I think a Sunday night or so before the vacation Bible school that... <clears throat> it's difficult today really to compete with what kids are dealing with. And, you, and you, you try to get kids to come because you want them to hear the gospel. What do you do? You, you do all kinds of crazy things to make it fun uh, for everybody, but you can't compete with what they already have. The kids are already completely content with everything um, that they got in life, right? So you can't entertain them enough to bring them in. Um, uh, you, you, you're competing with young people that are being bombarded with philosophies that are against the word of God. It used to be, years ago, that children were a, an open field as far as giving them the gospel. And they were very receptive to those things. And the Lord said, you know, suffer the children to come unto me. They were very receptive to those kind of things. Children today are not so much that way. You know, we had a, we had a couple of young girls come this last week. 12, 13-year-old girls, 12-year-old girls. And uh, they, they would not listen to the preaching. Every time we began to preach, they would leave the service. They would walk around during the Bible. We, we've got these little books where you, you memorize the Bible and you can get tickets for memorizing Bible verses. And some of the Bible verses were really easy, some of them were real common, you know. And, and the kids, every night, they could take their Bible verses and they could stand from memory and get tickets for that last night. They would not memorize Bible verses. And, and I said to them, I said, hey, you're going to memorize some verses? No, we're okay. They didn't want to read the Bible. And I, and I thought to myself, well, they're probably just not having a good time, and, you know, they're probably just, we can't compete with all the entertainment that they have these days. They're just not enjoying themselves. They're just kind of whatever. And, but then I realized throughout the week, they were enjoying themselves, but they were purposely not wanting to hear the Word of God. And then one of the girls asked Emily, my oldest daughter, on the bus ride home, she said to Emily, she said, is it a sin to be an atheist? Now, these kids, where are they getting this stuff? They're being bombarded, who knows where, their public school or their families or whatever, all right? In fact, the first night they decided they weren't going to come back. Uh, but then they ended up, ended up coming back every night. You know, they had told some of the folks here that they weren't going to come back the rest of the week, but they never told me that. So I, I just stopped by the house and said, hey, I'm coming by 6.30 to pick you guys up. And they were like, oh, and I said, we got big things tonight, you got to be there. Oh, okay. And so <laughs> I came around, six, you know, at 6 o'clock, picked them up, brought them. Uh, they never told me they weren't coming back. I'm going to get them. <laughs> uh, so uh, I went and got them, brought them to VBS, and, uh, and they heard the limited time they were actually listening. They heard the gospel being preached. Uh, my point is, though, uh, uh, we cannot, I, mean, I, ca I cannot combat what these kids are up against with my personality, with my preaching, with, with our contesting games. And we're going to do all these things because I'm going to do what I can to do the best job that I can. And we're going to, VBS is a great way to get kids to come in as the game and stuff. But that being said, we have to have prayer. We have to be begging God to do a work here. The Holy Spirit has to work in these young people's hearts. There are some of the things that kids said last week on the bus and, and different things that they, things that they said. You, you understand that they don't have any grounding of biblical knowledge at all. They understand that what the Bible is and they know some of the stories 
but as far as their overall philosophy of life, it's not from a biblical perspective. And, and someone told me, Noel was talking to one of, the young, one of the young boys, I think it was one of the kids, and Noel was talking to him on the bus, I wrote, Noel rode on the bus, and Noel said to one of the boys, he said, I, you know, I'm engaged to get married. And he said, I'm going to get married next year, I'm engaged to get married. And the, the boy's first response to that was, how long do you think that's going to last? That's how he responded to knowing, telling him he's going to get married. Really? That's what you think of marriage? Your first question is how long you think that's going to last? No doubt this kid comes from a broken home of some sort. That's just what he's used to. That's what he thinks happens in marriages. They just break up. But these are young people that, 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 that don't know the word of God and don't have a biblical foundation in their home, and there's no way, there's no way we're going to win them over with our personalities. No way we're going to win them over with good preaching. No way we're going to win them over with activities. We have to have prayer for this lost world that the Holy Spirit would convict them and that whatever Bible we can get into them, that the Holy Spirit would use that to work in their hearts and lives. And we have to beg God to do something in them. When's the last time we prayed for lost souls? Peter was ready to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. But he was praying in preparation for that. Peter prayed, okay? Peter heard from God. Number one, Peter prayed. Number two, Peter heard from God. Verse 11 through 13, and saw heaven opened and a uh, certain vessel descending um, unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down in the earth and wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice from him saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. God has spoken to him. Peter uh, heard from God himself <coughs> Today you and I have too many distractions in our lives and we're, we're comfortable going day after day after day not getting answers to prayer, not hearing from God and it's high time we as believers said, listen, I have to hear from God. I have to know what God wants for my life. I have to know what God desires for me to do. I have to hear from the Lord and cut out some of the distractions and take some of those things that, that demand our time and set those things aside and say, God, I have to hear from you. Peter heard from God. You want to have a heart in that life that's ready to be a witness, you need to hear from the Lord. God's got to work through us. I was very careful, very careful last week to not push any of these kids into anything. Not only did I tell them how to get saved, but I asked them if they wanted to get saved, that they would raise their hand. And, and several of the nights, several of the kids raised their hand. But then I would say, you know what, if you really mean that, you really want to get saved, all right, then I want you to stand up during the invitation and go into the back of the, back of the auditorium. Someone's going to show you from the Bible. Several kids raised their hand. Very few kids actually got up and walked back there. And, and I wanted them to actually take that step because I wanted them to know they're serious about this. Furthermore, I want someone to make sure that they understand. I cannot deal with all, all individually as a group, make sure they all understand and they're listening to what I'm saying. But if you're talking to them one-on-one -on -one in the back, you can make sure they're understanding what they're doing uh, and they have to understand. And, and I was very careful to make sure that they understood that they're not making a decision to join a church or to uh, uh, come on Sunday or, or, or do anything like that. They're putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and they have to hear from God himself and we have to make sure that they're hearing from God's word. So often we have so many distractions, we're not hearing from the Lord. Peter heard from God. How can I be ready to do when God wants to send me? Okay, Peter prayed. Peter heard from God. Peter struggled. We'll have to remember this. This isn't like a step on what to do to get God to use you, but we have to keep this in mind. Peter struggled with what he heard. Understand that we're not all perfect, but God still wants to use us. In fact, Peter said in verse number 14, and Peter said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Peter said, Lord, I, I can't do that. He argued with God. Uh, and, and he did not always obey God right away like he should have. The Bible says that he, doubt, uh, you know, he doubted, verse number 17, and now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. He said, I just don't quite understand what the Lord's trying to tell me. I don't, I don't get what he's trying to say. How could I possibly eat that stuff if it's not right? And Peter was struggling with what God was trying to tell him to do. And let me tell you something. You and I at times may struggle with what it is God would have us to do. That doesn't mean God's done with us. and it doesn't mean God doesn't want to use us. God can still prepare us. And eventually, number four, Peter did obey. So Peter prayed. He heard from God. And he obeyed. Notice verse number 23. Well, verse number... Uh, verse number... 
20, so the, uh, arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. That's what God told them to do when these people would come to the door. Verse 23, then called he them in and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. They, he, he left with them, and the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, he went with these people as God had told him to do. Peter obeyed. Now, there are people in our lives that we will come in contact with, that we need to be a witness to. And a lot of things we need, right? We need boldness. We need God's Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to, to tender their hearts. We need God's direction in this because we want to come across people who want to know. Wouldn't it be great to be able to come to somebody who really wants to know the truth? And then we want the Lord to direct in that. Uh, but we need to pray. We need to hear from God. <coughs> and we need to be obedient to the Lord's directing as he gives us opportunity. Oftentimes, our biggest problem is we're not obedient. God will give us an opportunity. We don't take advantage of that. And God can work in our hearts. God can direct in us. And God can lead us to a Cornelius that wants to hear more about him. God can lead us to somebody that wants to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we ready to be used of the Lord in that way? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Simple message tonight, Lord, but... So often, there are opportunities, and you do prompt us to do something. So often, Lord, you convict us about handing somebody a gospel tract or telling somebody about you, but yet we miss that opportunity or pass that up for whatever reason. Lord, give us boldness and give us courage. Lord, help us now as we go through our days to be continually seeking you out and praying to you and spending time with you and may our hearts be prepared to be a witness for you as you bring those opportunities along and lord may we continue to be obedient to that great commission telling everyone we know uh, as the opportunities arise about you and how you save and how you died for them and with their head bowed and their eyes closed in just a moment we're going to give an invitation maybe god spoken to your heart tonight maybe there's a decision you need to make Maybe there's someone you need to witness to, somebody you know that you've had an opportunity, you, you, you missed that, you passed that opportunity up, and you know you need to witness to them. Maybe tonight's the night to come to this old fashioned altar and say, Lord, I'm recommitting to, to taking advantage of these opportunities. Maybe it's been a while since you spent time with the Lord and you prayed, or maybe you've been disobedient to Him in some areas, and, and you're, you're hurting your effectiveness to be used of God in a way that He wants to use you when He sends someone to your life, into your life. If that's your case, his altar is open for you. You can talk to him about that. Maybe there's someone here that's not saved. You need to trust Christ as your Savior tonight, tonight to make that decision. Whatever the case may be, this altar is open. Let's all stand as we stand. The piano begins to play. God spoke unto your heart.